All right. Welcome to the Whitliff Collections. As you can see, our surprise guest is no surprise any longer. But uh, we've been waiting for this show for so long, it's uh, really unbelievable. So um, the event is called Caw Caw Blues. It's going to be a conversation with Terry Allen and Tamara Saviano. Uh, you can't do a Guy Clark celebration without music. And what better musicians than someone like Lloyd Maines and Terry Hendricks, who are just amazing. Um, I want to acknowledge Joe and Sharon Ely in the audience. Joe, after a tremendous night at ACL Live, incredible. You got to see the Sally Whitliff in the house. Beautiful, always a great vibe. And of course, Louise O'Connor. If you look around at all these beautiful photographs, this is her exhibit, Crying for Deadlight. So we're honored to have her. We had to open up the wall for the crowd, but usually there's some more of her photographs there. So. This is about as colorful as I think the room has ever been, and I think it's wonderful, wonderful. Like I said, the Caw Caw Blues event has been planned since 2019. Different factors came into play about why we're having it today. But I want to just say that Terry Hendricks is one of the tremendous Texas, really national treasures. I just did an event with her about three weeks ago. I was blown away by her and Kimmy Rhodes and Rosie Flores. And then Lloyd Maine's got a record out now and all the stuff he's done as a producer and engineer and musician. He's the go-to man. He was part of the Joe Ely event. I know he's been on stage with Terry and he's here everywhere. Uh, but anyway, this is, I don't know, if it, is this the cherry on top to the cherry on top? Or uh, I guess it's too many, too, many, uh, too many good things on this one. But anyway, Terry Hendricks, Lloyd Maines, take it away. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, first off, I just want to say what an honor it is to be here. And I also want to say that uh, Rachel Laban the young woman that was supposed to play here today. She's, she wasn't feeling well, but I've watched that little kid grow up to be an amazing songwriter. So here's a shout out to Rachel and that we miss her. So. Dug a bone press one two three pound key at the tone drive by satellite to get home blame retrograde sleep alone 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 online looking for somebody or a sign of life press star one nine please hold to reach mankind messenger to mercury messenger to mercury i want to talk to a human It pays. It's dog eat dog on the race to space. Download, update, phone to face. The big machine knows our place in line. Alone in line, bumper to bumper, the daily grind. They troll the rabbit hole. Please hold to keep your soul. Messenger to Mercury, messenger to Mercury. I want to talk to a human. Where is 
doggy dog on the race to space. Download, update, bone to face. The big machine knows our place in line. Hello in line. Bumper to bumper, the daily grind. They troll the rabbit hole. Please hold to keep your soul. Please hold to keep your soul. Hold me. Hold me. Please hold to keep your soul. Please hold to keep your soul. Hold me. I want to talk to a human. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I had to improvise on that one because I kind of blew the final verse of which you you wouldn't know unless I told you because I'd be willing to bet some of y'all have never heard me play before. <laughs> but there's a significant part of that, of that song that I want to tell you about. Um, and what it is is talk to a human only if it's clear Wait, talk to, the human, talk to a human, how they're going to hear. I'm invisible to them. Let me be clear. It's about the money, honey. Ain't about you. So unplug the yellow and get the blue. All right, I'm back online. Now, who hasn't been there before, right? <laughs> so that song was pretty much finalized um, in 2020 on January 6th when, when things were going kind of gadzooks in our country. And, and um, I had been diagnosed with dysphonia at the time, which is, an in, which is something that embeds itself in the vocal cords. And I'm telling you this because I don't like, want you to worry. Every, everyone is safe. But now and then I might sound like a, uh, like a goat uh, or I might sound like a donkey. And I just don't want y'all to worry. It's all okay. But during, when I had this problem and I, was, um, and I was working on Talk to a Human and what to say about that tune, uh, I lucked into actually talking to a human and I was, as I was getting my router set back up again. And, uh, and it was wonderful to, to human kindness. So here we have an election coming up and I say whoever's kind, they get my vote. Vote for the kind ones. But, um, this, um, I, it's, it's a real honor to be here today, um, more than I can say, because it's, it's almost apropos. Lloyd was at ACL um, a few nights back um, bringing in a gentleman that I've never had the courage to tell him this, but I'm going to do so now, um, probably single-handedly sculpted my whole performance. Um, now, please don't feel like that's a shameful thing, but <laughs> but um, he he inspired me in in ways I can't just hit the the way he gets on stage and the way uh, he delivered his songs and accepted no apologies. Here it is, and you're gonna like it. And if you don't, you're gonna still find a way to like it. <laughs> you're you're held captive. So Joe Ely. Uh, I just, I just want to say thank you for the muse. Thank you. All right. Now, uh, at my old house, I used to have a house on Rolling Oaks, and I, I moved because I know it's going to flood out there. I just know it. And so I moved. I, I have this premonition. So I moved, and I moved to higher land. But the thing that I miss most about the house is that I had quotes all over the walls of my favorite lyrics and songs. And, and I'm not going to say that one yet, but <laughs> I, I know I'm not. No, I'm not. But there are, I'm about to play you two songs. He's producing me. Did y'all catch that? <laughs> Next thing is tune your B string. All right. But uh, no, but, but no, there's two quotes. All right. And one of the quotes was, how dark is it? It's so dark. You can smell the moon. And to me, that's one of my favorite all-time lyrics. And that said, here's a little bit of some Terry Allen. No, it's wrong. Darn. Oh, 
no, no, what am I saying? Yes, Guy Clark. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bust me for trying to keep you on line here. Yeah. 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 I got it. Okay, okay. In the first place, Hector, Hector asked us if we had... I got bone puzzled. If we had any, any uh, Guy Clark or Terry Allen stories. So I've got one of each. So I'm going to uh, let you know about Guy Clark, what we, uh, a story about Guy Clark. We were playing in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan at a place called The Ark. Great venue there for, uh, for original music. And Guy Clark was there with uh, Berlin Thompson, so we opened, we opened that show. And uh, it was back, back when, when Guy was, well, he, he was just still absolutely dynamic and, and sounded great. He was having a little bit of uh, leg problems. He, uh, his leg or his ankle or something was giving him trouble. So after the show, when uh, Terry and Guy were out front in the, in the lobby, selling merchandise uh, right there side by side. And of course, I was breaking, breaking all the gear down as usual. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so I walked up and I, I just watched Terry sitting beside Guy and thinking, you know, she is probably about to pee her pants because she is such a Guy Clark fan. <laughs> and I know that you were excited. And uh, so anyway, after the, the, the merchandise kind of, kind of stopped there, uh, they boxed everything up, and uh, of course they both handed me their merchandise boxes to ca take back to the. <laughs> yeah. So I was doing. I was carrying the merchandise back, and I looked back, and and Guy was was kind of leaning on Terry. Uh, you know, she, she was helping him back to the dressing room, and uh, when when she got back there, she said, "You." Yeah. She said, "I can't believe it. Guy Clark asked me to help him. He asked me to help him <laughs> help him walk back to the dressing room." And I'm so excited about that. I said, look, before you start feeling all special, uh, that's, that's not the first time he's used that line. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway. All I could think about, all I could think about is how much, um, every time he would have a record come out, I, would, I, was, I loved Sundance Records in San Marcos. And, and I would go to Sundance and I would get that, the record and I would just read the lyrics before I ever listened to a note. Uh, and to me, that's the difference between a songwriter and regular music. You just got to get those lyrics and read them and, and soak them in and they become your DNA. And, um, and so th I remember when I was walking with Guy, this one specific thought that my mom always says in very important times she says terry when you're when you're having an important moment in your job it's very important that you remember that you only take your foot out of your mouth to change feet less is more terry less is more <laughs> so that's all i could think about when i was helping guy clark all right dark. You can sometimes hear your own heartbeat or the heart of the one lying next to you. And the house settles down after holding itself up all day. Shoulders slump, give a big sigh. And you hear no one's footfall in the hall. drip in the kitchen sink it keeps marking time june bug on the window screen can't get in but it keeps on trying one way or another we're all in the dark fireflies sparks lightning and stars Fires, moon, headlights on cars, the northern lights, the Milky Way. You can't see that stuff in the day. When 
the earth turns its back on the sun and the stars come out and the planets they start to run around and around now they call that day is done but you know what it's really just getting started and uh, some folks, they take comfort in that. How dark is it? It's too dark for goblins. And how dark is it? It's so dark you can smell the moon. And how dark is it? It's so dark the sky's on fire. And how dark is it? It's so dark the wind gets lost and how dark is it it's so dark you can see Fort Worth from here Thank you. All right, so Lloyd, don't hold out. You had some really good Terry Allen stories that you were telling me. I've got a bunch. I know, I've, I've, but the, you're all the limited second time here. And, no, uh, we, we're good. That seems like a really nice, high-class crowd, so I'm not going to tell most of the stories. Uh, but I am going to tell one. It, it's not, not that funny. It's just interesting. Uh, well, you know, I'm going to tell a short one. My brothers and I... Uh, I've got three brothers, and, and we've got a bunch, a bunch of friends that are live brothers. So back when I lived in Lubbock, and, and uh, Terry Allen was coming to Lubbock to do his recordings, we decided, uh, and also Terry's father-in-law, uh, Harvey Kuntz, went with us too, but we, we decided to take Harv and Terry fishing because uh, uh, just, just for an outing, just for the guys to go out to the, to the lake. There was a place called White River Lake, which was neither a river or a lake. I'm not sure what, what the exact, <laughs> it was pretty, pretty lame, but it was West Texas. Uh, so we went, we always went fishing there once a year, so we decided to take Terry Allen and Harvey with us. And the first thing that happened, uh, and this, this is not Terry's fault, but we, we fished all night long. We stayed up all night. Uh, we were camping out and drinking beer and just, just acting, acting nutty. And so, but Harv was a serious fisherman, and, and he, was, he was fishing on the bottom for these great catfish. And uh, so Harv caught a catfish, literally, I'm not exaggerating, he was like this long. And, uh, and so we all celebrated with another beer. And so anyway, he put him on a stringer, uh, and, and he was gonna, you know, leave him there all night, and then, and then the next, next morning he was gonna uh, dress him out. So we, all night long, we, Harvey would go over and he would, because nobody else was catching anything, and Harvey would really rub it in. Uh, hey, boys, look at this, you know, we were like, okay, okay. So the next morning, my brother Donnie, uh, and we were all up kind of, kind of, you know, cross-eyed and, and uh, trying to get woken up, uh, drinking coffee, and, and so Donnie walks over, and, and sometime during the night, this fish had, if, you, if you're familiar with fish stringers, it's like a, it's like a little clasp. Somehow this fish had worked that clasp open. He was still attached. But Donnie, he's, he's going to like, you know, do the old Harv thing. So Donnie walks over and says, hey, Harv, how about this? He lifts up the stringer, and the fish just falls into the water, just strips, <laughs> strips. And so that started the day off great. And uh, you know, Harv, Harv had a great sense of humor. He just said, yeah, well... Uh, I catch them, and y'all release them faster than I can catch them. Uh, so anyway, later on in the day, Terry Allen and, and all, all the brothers are sitting on these rocks fishing for crappie, and uh, we're using floats, uh, and nobody's catching anything. Uh, we're sitting there drinking beer on the, on the rocks, and uh, so finally, you know, it was getting boring, 
And uh, Terry had been bragging about what a great fisherman he was. And anyway, he, he got up and he went to get uh, uh, another beer or something. While he was gone, I caught this huge crappie. And I told my brothers, I said, man, let's have some fun with Terry Allen. So I took the fish off my line. I put it on his line. Where is Terry? I want to make sure he's hearing this. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know you're hiding your face right now. So anyway, uh, uh, I put, put the fish on, on his line. And of course, the fish went totally to the bottom, took his float totally under the, under the water. And, uh, and so I just said, everybody, just don't say a word about it. Don't say a word. We're going to see how long it takes him to notice that he's got a fish. So he comes back, he sits down with his beer, and he's sitting there. This is back when he was smoking, sitting there smoking a cigarette, trying to carry on the conversation, and we're all like. Anyway, he never, he never noticed. He never noticed that his float was under. So I, finally I had to say, uh, I made it real dramatic. I said, hey, whoa, Terry, look, you got a fish. And he, he you know, gets up, drops his beer, reels it in big time, lifts it up and said, yeah, yeah. Just like I told you, I'm the fisherman of this bunch. <laughs> and and, and I, I, I couldn't hold back. I said, hey, we caught the, I caught that fish, and we put it on your line. And, of course, he immediately started denying everything about that. <laughs> so, anyway, that's, you, it's one of those you kind of had to be there. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, that, uh, that was a long story. The, uh, the other one was about us, us going to uh, Terry Cole and ask, if I would fly to Houston with him because he was going to trade a piece of his art to Betty Moody uh, for a 1972 Cadillac Fleetwood. Okay. And uh, I said, sure, we'll go down. He wanted me to ride back with him. We went down and we stayed in this kind of kind of really shabby motel. But it, the motel had a club attached to it. And so, so we got the Cadillac, made the, made the art swap. Uh, and we noticed that the sign said, tonight, Ernest Tubb. And, man, I had always, both of us had always wanted to see Ernest Tubb live. So we said, man, we're going. We're going. I don't, it, was, it was like tickets were really cheap. Uh, the place wasn't even full. We went in, and we got to hear Ernest Tubb live. And this, this is about, about six weeks before Ernest Tubb passed away. And I remember he, Ernest Tubb played for four hours, four straight hours, and then he stayed for about another hour and signed any, anything that anybody wanted to sign. So Terry and I both took our belts off. I've, not, uh, I've never cared about autographs, but I wanted to get Ernest Tubbs autograph. Do you still have your belt? All right. Anyway, Ernest Tubbs signed our belt. And then we drove that 72 Cadillac back from Houston to Lubbock. We had about, I know we had two flats. It could have been, could have been more. But, but, you know, it, it was that trip back that I learned about this man. And we've pretty much been, been brothers ever since. Um, Except you've been, you've, been for, you've been forgetting my Christmas gifts. But <laughs> I, 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 I mean. And you know what? I've known you for, for a really long time now, T, and I don't have a Christmas gift yet. <laughs> I'm doing, but um, I just, I, I want to say that on my wall in my hallway, oh, yeah. uh, this, um, if, again, when you write songs, and, and especially if you decide to deviate off of what is considered to be the norm, and who knows what that is, and who knows who built that, I don't, as far as I'm concerned, it's always been a very blurry line, but but this next tune to me spoke right to my heart. And there are times when I'm in situations where I know when I play, it's going to be, you know, right over the tops of the heads. But I know that my job is, as a songwriter is to write with intention. And also in part of the, there's cons consequences to intention. And that is... I believe perseverance is the consequence because if you believe in what you're doing, you just keep going regardless. And to me, that's what Terry Allen, that's the type of artist he is. And this song is an anthem, I feel, to any artist that ever uh, is contrary to ordinary. His 
is lonely is only a blank space in the hallway on the wallway between the hangings of paintings of lonely that ain't lonely at all. chorus of giving my flowers while I'm living, yeah. okay? It's right. It's the right thing to do. It's the right way to end this set. I again want to say what an honor it has been to be here, and um, I don't ever take one, oppor one opportunity to come and play music for granted, and I'm so happy to see y'all here supporting such an important project. Um, again, Lloyd Maines, thank you. In this world today where we're living Some folks are gonna say The worst of us they can But when we are dead and in our caskets They always slip some lilies in our hands won't you give me my flowers while I'm living? Wanna sing? And let me enjoy them while I can. Don't wait till I'm ready to be buried. And then slip some leaves in my hand. Well, in this world, it's where we need our flowers. We need that one kind word to help us get along. If you can't get me flowers while I'm living, then please don't throw them when I'm gone. Help me out. Won't you give me my flowers while I'm living? And let me enjoy them while I can. Don't wait till I'm ready to be buried. And then slip some lilies in my I'm still it one more time. Let's do it. Won't you give me my flowers while I'm living? And let me enjoy them while I can. Don't wait till I'm ready to be buried. And then slip some. Thank you.
Thank you. Wonderful sound. I appreciate the sound. Thank you. Folks, for Terry Hendricks, Lloyd Maines, and we do have Terry Hendricks archives here at the Whitliff Collections, some of them on display at, in the Texas Music Gallery, so I would uh, suggest it, maybe you see them. And, uh, you know, here at the Whitliff, the materials that we preserve and that we collect and present, I mean, it really is dependent on folks like yourself coming out and supporting it, and also people like uh, Joe Nick Patowski, who has helped so much with the, you know, getting the music archives together, and Dr. Uh, Gary Hartman, and Jason Mellard, and so many people, you know, it, it really does take a village on this. And uh, let me tell you, I, I want to live in Terry Hendricks' village, <laughs> and Lloyd Maines' village, what musical, right. So as we get everybody kind of going, I had mentioned earlier that this program has been years in the making. I mean, it really started with uh, not a whisper campaign, but sort of a, what the hell is Bill Whitliff talking about this crow? And, uh, you know, I remember it was, he'd gotten this thing and Guy Clark said, it didn't make sense. And then also you start to realize what this piece of art is and what it could be. And also the interest that it was gonna generate um, we here at the Whitlam, you know, we're trying to think, well, how do we present this thing for the first time? You know, how do, what do, what do we do? It, had, it hadn't even come here to the Whitliff. We just knew that the cock, we, did, we didn't know what the title of it was. We didn't know it was called Cock Hall Blues. Just that this beautiful crow, this tribute to Guy Clark. We have his sister right here and Carol right in the front row. And we know we wanted to treat it with we wanted to treat that piece with, you know, the utmost, of course, reverence and respect, but also, you know, how do you debut something like that? So, you know, one of our plans and the first, the initial part was to uh, present it a soft opening at South by Southwest in, at, in 2020. And it was going to be at the Luck Reunion there on Willie Nelson, at Willie Nelson's ranch. Uh, we had uh, sponsored the artists room where the performers would, uh, you know, get ready. And we figured this would be a, a good way for uh, musicians and just regular folks and journalists from around the country to see close up what it was. Well, of course, COVID put the big kibosh on all that stuff, everything, as, as different festivals shut down and then the South by Southwest. And I, and I remember that year, Luck Reunion kind of held on, held on, and it was like almost the last couple of days we were hoping against hope, but it was not to be. So the next thing was uh, the crow coming over, the, the, sculpt, the piece of sculpture coming to the Whitliff. And it was, uh, you know, we had this grand plan that, oh, well, it's going to debut at South by Southwest, and people are just going to go nuts, and this is what Bill and Sally were talking about, you know. And instead, it came over with uh, Joe Harvey and uh, Terry driving over. We're all, it's at the height of COVID. We're all in masks. We don't even want to get close to each other. They pull it in a truck. It's raining. It's cold. Remember? I mean, I think uh, Joe Harvey is described as a d drug deal. Could have been. <laughs> That's about how we were acting, you know. And they pulled it out. You know, we pull out this piece of uh, sculpture from the back of the truck. It was just on a seat put on the little cart and rolled it in. And I couldn't help, Mark Willenborg was rolling it in, and I couldn't help thinking, oh my God, I can't believe, you know, we had this, oh, the vision of it. I mean, it played out like a Terry Allen song. It played out like a Terry Allen song, you know. But then, you know, it's here, and then, you know, and I'm gonna get the stars of the show on real quick, but, you know, when you see the beauty of the thing in person, but then you wanna photograph it, and it's, it doesn't always, uh, as a, again, as a, you know, working in the different mediums that you work in, Terry, you, you know, when something's that color to make it get the detail that you see, you know, it was figuring out how to photograph it, where to place it. You know, as the music curator, uh, you know, I said, hell yeah, it's going to be in the music gallery. But then, you know, we all really thought it needs to be at the entrance where people can see it, sometimes walk past it and go, holy what is that? You know, or they, they'll be standing right by it and they'll say, where's the Guy Clark crow? Where is it? Well, 
Let me just tell you. And then when you explain what it is, and um, as Terry told me a little bit, and Tamara and Terry are going to talk about the crow. You know, it's a tribute to Guy Clark, their friendship. And, uh, you know, the reason uh, that Tamara is involved, besides being a great author and filmmaker, I mean, she's just so passionate about Guy, Guy Clark. I mean, I, and about Terry Allen, and about all the musicians of the Southwest who she knows personally, has worked with, and I just thought there'd be no better person really to moderate a conversation than Tamara Saviano. We have her film playing in the music gallery without getting killed or caught. I mean, also, what an amazing documentary. I mean, really, really. I mean, to, to tell it, to tell that story of, a, of essentially a love triangle, you know, Guy Clark and Susanna and Towns and what that friendship, very complicated relationship was, and to tell it through, really, in essence, Susanna's eyes and with Sissy Spacek narrating it, it's just a, I think it's brilliant, and I've, I've seen it so many times, it's just, it's, it's just wonderful. And then Terry Allen, you know, not only have we wanted to celebrate him for such a long time, um, it, it's, it, I just saw him perform Friday. And I was thinking, my God, you know, it's like when you see people like Joe Ely or Terry Hendricks or Lloyd or something. I mean, they're just wonderful performers. But, you know, uh, he was being accompanied by his son and uh, one other musician and just, just so those songs so stripped down. And I was thinking to myself, you know, Terry Allen is either the uh, sort of the uh, Sam the Lion of Texas music, you know, or he's one of those guys that takes it to the outer edge of outer space, you know. I mean, a lot, a lot is said about how Lubbock on everything kind of put him, you know, really got all the kudos. But, man, if I was a musician, I would have been scared when Juarez came out. Because to me, you know, you take that. It's just the, the lyrics that he's talking about, and they're very careful and, you know, Joe's a visual artist. He's a visual artist. And something tells me, too, that, that they're, where they grew up out there on that flat land that, and that imagination that, uh, you know, goes into their life. There's, there's something about that. And his songs are so character-driven that it is like uh, watching a movie. And, uh, you know, I guess in a certain way, um, I mean, I've heard on the radio before, sometimes they describe you as a cult artist, you know, I mean, I, I, I see more as like the Chuck Yeager of Texas music. He took it to like, you know, it's right there where, right there, the wildness, you know, that kind of curiosity and just imagination and really fearlessness that a lot of writers and singer-songwriters weren't doing. They weren't, they weren't doing it with that sort of, uh, I don't know what you call it, just a sort of an angry young man, sort of a, a leanness to the thing. Could be just because he performed on the piano. Um, could be just because, uh, I don't know, his, the characters in the songs are sort of horny and lustful, and the way people talk, the way people really talk, made him a very interesting uh, character. So anyway, I turn it over to the stars of the show, Terry Allen, Tamara Saviano, if they can walk on stage. We're going to be uh, talking about caw, caw blues, music, and whatever they want to talk about. So turn it over. Hello. <laughs> well, here we are. <laughs> Uh, before we start, I just want to say um, thank you to Terry Hendricks and Lloyd Maines. And Terry is too humble to say that her version of The Dark on our Guy Clark tribute album with 30 songs was Guy's favorite. So I just wanted all of you to know that. Um, so, Terry, <laughs> I want to start with Caw Caw Blues and uh, how that came to be. Tell us why there's a sculpture with Guy Clark's cremains in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Guy and I periodically went out together and played together, but I think uh, one of the 
uh, we, we, we were on this thing for a landmine-free world that Emmylou Harris had put together. And we played a series of concerts in uh, California. And one of them was in, in La Jolla at the University of California, and where I had a piece uh, that these trees that have uh, music that comes out of them. I ask all these different musicians to uh, do something they'd like people to hear coming out of a tree. And um, then I, there's another tree with poets and writers that uh, you just hear it as you walk through these kind of groves of trees. There'll be this giant lead tree all of a sudden with music coming out of it. Anyway, I took Guy to see that. And then uh, we were in San Francisco uh, playing uh, somewhere. And uh, <coughs> I have a piece there called The Shaking Man which is uh, just this bronze piece with that, uh, just this guy kind of shaking with a lot of teeth and it's falling, <laughs> kind of like a used car dealer. You know? <clears throat> and he looks a lot like Ronald Reagan. You know? <laughs> but I was, you know, he was supposed to be a greeter in, Mus in Moscone Plaza in the park. And that's what, it, what I was commissioned to do. But anyway, you know, the guy saw quite a bit of my work over a period of time, and um, um, he got this idea that he was going to, you know, when he died, he wanted uh, to be cremated and have his ashes put in one of my pieces, which I thought was completely ridiculous. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, and, you know, I would tell him, so the guy, I'm going to do a goat. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna take your ashes and I'm gonna shove it up its ass. And, <clears throat> and he would go, perfect. <laughs> so that gives you the kind of idea of the kind of rapport we had with each other. You know? uh, but uh, it, it wasn't something that I ever took serious, particularly, you know. And then uh, when he got sick. Uh, we started having these conversations. Um, uh, we'd gone to Mexico, and, and uh, I was working on a song. A uh, guy, Joe Harvey, and I were walking down a street in Oaxaca and, and uh, looking at these blue houses. And, and uh, Joe Harvey said, oh, look at that one. That is, that's really, really blue. <laughs> Uh, and I said, no, yeah, but it's, it's not the perfect blue. And Guy said, the perfect blue, that's a song, you know. And um, so I started working on this song called The Perfect Blue. Um, and uh, Guy, meanwhile, had started working on this song called The Call Call Blues, which he st became kind of obsessed with these in, at the Windmill Museum in Lubbock. Uh, there are these crow's nests that were in kind of the derrick of the, the windmill uh, that were all bob wire. They were crow's nests that were from the d dust bowl. And it's really all the crows had to, to make a nest out of. It was all this just crap they could find, but mostly it was metal and bob wire. And, uh, and Guy uh, loved those. And he talked about, you know, he loved just kind of the the beauty of, of that object. And, uh, and so he started working on a song, and, I, and uh, uh, I, I don't know if it was the last song, but it was certainly one of the last songs he ever did. Wow. And uh, uh, Rodney, I, you know, every time I called him and talked to him, and he was kind of failing, but he would talk about these crows and this, this crow's nest. And... and um, and it, to me, it, it stopped being kind of about the crow and started being kind of his own kind of facing mortality, facing his own end. And uh, um, so that registered with, with me. And, you know, and also I, I love those, those crow's nests. But um, I didn't... I didn't make a connection really about it, it as an object, uh, making a sculpture out of it, uh, until uh, 
about a year after he passed. And, and, and it, it got very real because Rodney called me up and said, you, you, you know, if you want to see a guy, you better come now. And, and like two hours later, he called and said, just, just, you know, just, the guy's gone. And uh, so uh, Tamara kind of can take you from there because, <laughs> you know, it was kind of a, 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 an epic comedy in a way. It, it, it was an epic <laughs> comedy. Well, I remember that, um, you know, leading up to, Guy was sick for quite a while before he died, and he was in the nursing home and leading up to his death when he, you know, knew he was going into hospice and all this was happening. He kept saying, make sure Terry gets my ashes. He would say that to everybody that saw him. Make sure Terry gets my ashes. Make sure Terry gets my what ashes. An <laughs> <laughs> so when Guy died, um, Rodney and Verlin and Sean and, er and everybody that was, you know, in Guy's life at those, at those final days, uh, we had our marching orders. And so uh, I remember, you know, the day after, you know, right at, shortly after a guy died, calling you and saying, is it okay if we all come to your house and uh, bring Guy's ashes? Uh, Verlin had um, asked the funeral home director if he could just put Guy's ashes in, you know, an urn and drive it to Santa Fe. Was that legal? And the, the funeral home director said, sure. And so then we were all like, well, we want to come. Um, so, and I wasn't at this meeting with the funeral home director, but Rodney called me and said, because I was in Phoenix flying back when Guy died, and uh, Rodney called me when I landed and said, um, we need a tour bus and we need someone to plan this, and we're all songwriters and we don't know how to do that, so. <laughs> <laughs> so it became my job to, uh, to make this happen. So yeah, so we, we had a, um, a memorial service at uh, Senior McGuire's art studio in Nashville, and then we all boarded a bus at midnight for wow. Santa Fe, and it was Rodney and Sean and Verlin and Steve Earle and me and Guy's son, Travis. And, and Jim, right? McGuire was there, yep. Yeah, and then I, I, called, I called Joe when, when Rodney told me. I called Joe and told him that Guy had passed, and and that we were going to do try to do something, and he and Sharon uh, came, and and they called a while later. He came, and uh, I think he knew Lou. It's like all of these people, Robert and Kathleen, Robert and Kathleen Vince Gill, yeah, Vince, and all all yeah. these people just kind of stopped exactly. their lives, you know, whether whatever they were doing, and they came to Santa Fe for this night, and uh, um, we set up a kind of a little altar in the front room with uh, his boots on it, the ashes, and some candles, and an incredible photograph that, that uh, used w with the movie. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and we all, you know, everybody was just kind of talking, standing around, eating, and we had a lot of really good food and stuff. And then just kind of all of a sudden everybody ended up going into that room and standing there looking at uh, the altar and uh, his boots were there not to mention that yeah, these giant boots you know <laughs> and uh, guy was big yeah <laughs> <laughs> and and then one by one people kind of started telling a story of whatever you know about some story about guy and then just walked out and we went out into the patio and sat around and, and around this, this kind of fire pit. And um, Steve Earl, somebody said, get, get a guitar. And Steve went and got his guitar. And uh, uh, he said, everybody do, a, everybody do a song that God would like to hear. You know? And uh, so it started this kind of round robin of the people tell, you know, telling little stories but singing songs. Vince Gill had written a song about Guy that was just, that Tamara ended up using in, in the, the, the book. Yeah, uh, but, they had, um, my book was scheduled to go to press right around the time Guy died and now I needed to write a new ending. 
and I was taxed to do that by the end of that weekend that I was at your house. Yeah. So uh, thank God Vince wrote that song because I had no idea what I would have used as an ending otherwise. Yeah, it was, it was it was a kind of an amazing night. Just and it was kind of funny how everything just happened the way it should happen, you know. The guy then, was orchestrating it. Yeah, it was. Even the sunset. There was this phenomenal <laughs> sunset that. Uh, oh, do you remember that sunset? That yeah, we were all just kind of like, night, yeah. no, that's too, that's too good for him. <laughs> <laughs> It's got to be somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> if some of this sounds familiar to the, those of you who have seen the film, it's because it's, it's in yeah. the, everything we're talking about is in the end of the film, yeah. including uh, we end the film with the Caw Caw Blues sculpture, and Paul and I flew out to Santa Fe after Terry finished it to film it, and it was really emotional to see yeah. how guys' ashes look like flecks of gold in the yeah. sculpture. You'll have to get a good look at it when you, when you see it. Yeah, it wasn't until, I, I did a, a <laughs> number of kind of drawings of different ideas and whatever, and thought about different sites to put it. One thing, Guy, uh, when I, whenever he had come to visit, there was a spot kind of in, in the backyard that looked out kind of over the mountains and whatever that, that he really liked. Both of us would sit and talk and, and uh, um, I, I, you know, thought for a while that, you know, because he really loves Santa Fe, we thought, well, we'll you know, whatever to do, I'll, I'll, I'll put it here because he liked this place. And, uh, and it wasn't for a while. I, t I think I gave Tamara, we were, we're in Newport, playing there, Joe and I, and uh, Chris Alderson, and, and uh, I, Tamara and I met for breakfast, and I gave, showed you a bunch of drawings that I had, and, and uh, including the crows. <coughs> and uh, I, I went to Uncommon Objects in Austin, and I, I would, there was a crow, stuffed crow in there, and I would go in, I'd look at it, and then I'd leave, and I'd go back and I'd look at it again and, and I must have done it about four or five times and I finally said, I'm, I'm just buying this thing. You know, I don't you know, it's just because it's saying something. And, um, and then I got the idea to do like a, a bronze uh, crow, which the size when it, got, it became more like a raven uh, once it, but uh, it was cast in... Uh, uh, at Bastrop, at Deep in the Heart Art Foundry in Bastrop. And the ashes, which I had for over a year, and I, I remember Steve Earle kept saying, well, what are you going to do? What are you, when are you going to do it? What are you going to do? You know? <laughs> okay. so, so quit worrying about it. You know? <laughs> well, what are you going to do? You know? <laughs> well, and it all you know, came together so beautifully with Rodney finishing the Caw Caw Blues yeah. song, and then, you know. Yeah, the, 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 the song was like, when I, when Guy would tell me the lyrics and stuff and, uh, over the phone, I, it didn't, I didn't think it was his greatest song, you know, but, but then when Rodney kind of put it together and the whole thing, then it, you know, it, it really gelled into something that meant a lot to me listening to it. And, uh, but anyway, what I'm saying is like the ashes, uh, the, the head, we, we took this crow that I got at Uncommon Objects and they pointed it up or enlarged it off on a, a digital printer and then uh, made a, 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 an object uh, and that we made uh, a mold kind of. And <coughs> I've, I put when when we poured the, the the molten bronze into the mold, I poured about a quarter of the ashes into the the the, uh, the molten bronze, and so the outside of the crow has its ashes, guys ashes, and then I opened up the breast of it and put the rest of the ashes in, so it's also an urn. 
that contains all of it and then seal that back up. So my regret, of course, is that I didn't shove it up the crow's ass. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, let's go back in time and um, tell everybody how you and Guy first met. Yeah, we met at, at the Kerrville Folk Festival, uh, I think 1980, 81, something like that, at, at, at the Wild Hilton Hotel in the lobby. Mm -hmm. And uh, we both kind of knew each other's music. And I had, I, you know, the, my favorite song, I think, of Guy's at that time was the first song I heard, which was Let Him Roll, and, uh, uh, because I loved that talking thing that, that he did. With, with, I always loved that style of what he was doing with like the Randall Knife and whatever, but it was just a beautiful poem to me. And <clears throat> So anyway, we knew each other, and we took the shuttle to... to uh, the festival and immediately got drunk as skunks, you know. And um, uh, the guy was had actually played the night before. I was getting ready to play the next day, and he uh, uh, he was waiting to get his check. And uh, so we were standing kind of in the wings, watching Peter, Paul, and Mary sing uh, "Puff the Magic Dragon" to <laughs> to all this, you know this vast array of dope-smoking hippies out there. <laughs> <laughs> and and I mean, w there was a, a, a full moon, and out of nowhere, this cloud came. And the cloud was, it was like a claw. It's like the Lord said, you kind of had to be there, you know. <laughs> but this, this cloud just like grabbed the moon. And Guy and I were looking at it, and we cracked up. All of a sudden, we started laughing. And the guy that ran the festival got really pissed off because we were making so much noise. And, and Peter and Paul got really pissed off. But, uh, Mary, Mary liked it. <laughs> you know, she, she thought it was funny. So, but anyway, so we got we got in trouble. I. I ended up getting banned after the next day. <laughs> and Guy, I think, was banned for a while. Uh, they never let you back? I, no, they never let me back. <laughs> uh, and Joe got banned. <laughs> you got banned too, Joe? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, it was the beginning of a lifelong that, friendship. It was the beginning of a long friendship that, you know, that... Uh, I remember we played uh, we played here at the oldest honky tonk. It's, that was I can't remember the town. I can't remember the name of the honky tonk, but it was out in the, kind of north of town, kind of around Round Rock or somewhere. And Joe Harvey and Guy and I went out, and it was a, had a real low ceiling and all these pool tables, and that people were shooting pool while you were playing and. Uh, and Guy and I again got got you know a little overly enthusiastic, and uh, uh, and Joe Harvey after we got off the stage, Joe Harvey just unloaded on us. Said that was the worst thing I've ever seen. You, you know, get drunk and act like idiots, and you know just went on and on. And Guy and I were both you know kind of hanged on. And then the next day, John T. Davis wrote the most glowing yeah. review. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, tell the story about getting barbecue. Was that in Birmingham? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> we, I played a gig with a guy in Nashville, Joe Harvey's with me, and then we were going to drive down to. Uh, Birmingham, where we would play a gig in Birmingham and Atlanta, whatever. But uh, so it's Joe Harvey and Susanna and Guy and I. And, and uh, I remember one of the things I remember about the trip there is they were talking about uh, uh, what's what's the restaurant, the uh, oh the one the Cracker Barrel. Yeah, yeah, you know, knickknack boogie, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> but but guy, guy and Susanna were just it'll, just raving about the Cracker Barrel. You know? <laughs> and, and we had <laughs> we stopped to have breakfast at the Cracker Barrel. Then we went to Birmingham, and uh, uh, in the room we started drinking again, and um, uh, we got pretty plowed and decided that we were too drunk to drive to uh, uh, to eat, but we were hungry, so we. We called a limo service, and uh, they brought this uh, limo, and uh, we said, take, take us to the very best barbecue place in Birmingham, you know, the very best barbecue joint. And this guy said, the best? He said, yes, the best, you know. And uh, so we got in. The limousine goes through the parking lot, turns to the right, and parks. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> That's kind of a story of my <laughs> relationship with God. <laughs> uh, I want to see if anybody wants to ask Terry a question. Anybody in the audience? Oh, Peter Blackstock. Yeah, Terry, I was wondering, you know, I was wanting to know which of you all would go first. And did you have any sort of reciprocal agreement with him where maybe if you went first, he'd he pick your academic complaints and take care of it? No, we never talked about that. <laughs> <laughs> We did paint once in a while. Like I remember, he came, he came at, at Christmas time, and and my son Bale, who's an artist, the three of us would do these things called exquisite corpse, which one of us would paint a little edge and then give it to the next one. They'd paint the edge blocked out and then block that out, and the next person would paint until you had this really, you know, kind of psychotic <laughs> picture. <laughs> but uh, I I never. I never talked to him about my demise. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? How did you decide the lyrics? I just thought it made sense. I always loved that little section of that song. And, you know, I mean, there's so many things you could have put on there, you know, that would have had a meaning. But... Uh, that little segment meant a lot to me. So. Guy's sister's here, by the way, y'all. That's k Yes, K-Rell's right here. <laughs> k -Row, can I tell the Austin City Limit story? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> Sharon and Joe were there for that one. So when the uh, Austin City Limits decided they were going to do the Austin City Limits Hall of Fame, it was either the first or second year, and they were going to induct Guy into the Austin City Limits Hall of Fame. This was in 2015. And he was really sick. But he was so excited, and he was like, I am going to Austin no matter what. And there was all this planning that had to go in how to get him to Austin. He couldn't fly anymore. So they ended up renting like a Mercedes fancy van and a driver <clears throat> and uh, got him to Austin and, you know, this is going to be great, this is going to be great. Well, Guy and Cairo and his other sister Jan, they really liked to party together. That Guy was always like when his sisters were coming, my sisters are coming, break out the tequila, break out everything, you know, that was, he loved, he loved doing that. So Cairo, in the spirit of the, the Clark siblings, had some edibles to share with her brother. <laughs> and she said, Guy, take one. But Guy never did that, so he took All of them. <laughs> three. Three. And uh, so he had done a little interview before, and we were sitting backstage and catering at, at ACL. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, and everyone's talking, and everyone's there to celebrate Guy, and all of a sudden Guy just slumps over. <laughs> and I didn't know that he had taken these edibles, so I thought he was having a stroke. And uh, so we quickly all 
you know, gathered around him, and I called Dr. Counts, like, what the hell do we do? What should we do? And, you know, he's like, take him to this hospital. I'll meet him there. And uh, so Lyle Lovett was out on stage explaining that Guy Clark had just taken ill as the ambulance was taking him to the hospital because he OD'd. <laughs> And the next, Terry wasn't there, and, but the news was getting out that, you know, Guy had taken ill, and the next morning, Terry called me, and I answered the phone, and Terry said, is he dead? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Not this time. And it wasn't funny at the time, but, but now it's, it's just really funny. Yeah, I, I remember we, we had an anniversary party in Marfa, and, and it was when Susanna had kind of taken to the bed while, but she decided she would get up and come to Marfa with Guy. Guy was going through chemo at the time, and uh, so he was, he wasn't in the greatest mood most of the time anyway, but uh, uh, we were, we were doing kind of a barbecue out at, in the uh, west of town, or, and uh, had parked all of the cars in the circles, and dancing in the middle and playing music. Joe, Joe danced so much that he couldn't walk for about three weeks. <laughs> and, 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 uh, but then a guy and Susanna, just kind of like these apparitions, came walking across the field. Susanna had this white uh, dress on. And, and, uh, it, but later we played at this pl a place called Joe's Bar. And... Uh, when the guy was tuning, and uh, this guy was, that friend was telling me this, his friend was had, was with a guy that was really drunk, and he was started kind of hitting on a, a very wealthy woman in Marfa, that, uh, and so he had to get him away from him. Then he started hitting on all these other wealthy women behind the, you know, at the back of the room. And so he took him, drug him down to the front of the stage, and guys, you know, tuning, and uh, hit hit guys' uh, uh, guitar, you know, with, and he said, "Oh, Mr. Clark, I'm so sorry I did it. You know, we we've, we've, we've come all this way to see you. We love you. We love everything that you do, you know. And you know, we're so proud to be here and happy to be here. And guy just looked at him and said, "Fuck you." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for anyone that has <laughs> for anyone that has Guy Clark on a pedestal, you can just take him off of that pedestal. <laughs> he was human. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Uh, Hector? No, I've, I've told the story a lot, but but that that song, Guy and I were in my studio, and it was they were here, and Susanna were visiting one Christmas, and uh, uh, my son Bale had been out walking around, and we had lost a dog about several months before that, named Queenie, and we didn't know what happened, we you know what happened, it just disappeared, and Bale had been walking around, he came into the studio, and he said. Uh, uh, Dad, I found a dead dog out here, and, and so I went out with him, and sure enough, it was Queenie with a not very obvious bullet hole in, in her side, and a really sweet, beautiful little dog, and so I, I came back to the studio, and Guy was sitting in there, you know, doing, you know, like he does it, right, yeah, and uh, I said, Guy, somebody, somebody shot my dog, some son of a bitch shot my dog. And he went, oh, well, let's write a song about it. <laughs> <laughs> so we did. <laughs> That's where. <laughs> time we ever were would get angry is when we were kind of working on a song and, and I've never really got mad at guy uh, 
I, I, he got mad at me once, I think, when I told him, you know, all you ever want to put in a song is an old man. <laughs> <laughs> he got really pissed at that. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, like I said, I was thinking about putting that piece at, at kind of on, on a portal above our patio, and just that's where it was going to be. And then it just didn't seem right. It, it seemed like, it, you know, even though God loved that view and whatever, I, I just felt like it ought to be shared with people. People ought to have it. And, and Bill... Uh, I couldn't think of anybody better to, you know, to, to call and, and tell him that I'd like to give it to the, you know, to him, to the, you know, collection here. And so I called him up and uh, told him about the piece, sent him uh, photographs of it, and uh, uh, he got real excited about taking the piece. And, and then, uh, ironically, he died like the next week, Bill did. And uh, uh, had told, fortunately, I had told uh, David and, uh, that uh, about the piece and that he wanted to, to be here. So that kind of set the whole thing in motion. And then COVID hit, and and Hector was talking about, uh, you know, the us getting the piece here. And it was like a, it was the guy would have loved it because it was like a total drug deal. You know? <laughs> It was like in that parking lot, everybody had masks on, moving the piece in, in one van, you know. And so it was, it was kind of perfect to get it, getting it here. But uh, that's how it got here. True. How do you think knowing Guy changed you as a person? How what? How is knowing Guy changed you as a person? Like how knowing him changed you as a person? Oh. It made me a lot worse of a person. <laughs> Sharon. amazing so we were in Santa Fe bringing guys ashes to Terry and uh, a couple of us stayed for a couple days and um, guy had that ring that he wore um, on his on his right ring finger and he uh, bought it with bunny guys uh, Susanna's sister um, at a Harvey house in Arizona when they were traveling through <coughs> in 1970 and it's, it was a night, and I did a lot of research on this ring after talking to Guy because I was always entranced, you know, just enchanted with this ring, and so I knew a lot about it. So Joe and Sharon and I were walking around Santa Fe, and we went into a little shop there, and Joe was looking at boots, and Sharon and I were over at the jewelry counter, and there were some vintage pieces we were looking at, and I spotted this ring. I don't know if you all can see it, but. Um, <clears throat> and so I asked to to see the ring, and I put it on, and I have really small fingers. I wear a size five ring, so most of the time rings are really big on me. But I put it on, and it fit me perfectly, and I said, oh, what's the story behind this ring? And the guy at the counter says, oh, that's a 1970 Harvey House ring. <laughs> and I looked at Sharon, and I was like gasping, like, uh, and I was like, I, I want it, you know? Yeah. And I, I felt like it was you know, a gift from Guy at that very moment in time. Yeah. Was, oh. yeah. Richard. Did you have any, uh, I guess with any major condition, like this, you want it to be good, did you have any, you know, you talk about Steve Roll saying, when, when you, have you done it yet, have you done it yet? <laughs> was any part of that, did you have any kind of emotional, like kind of anxiety of like, this is, I mean, I don't know if you've worked with Ashes before, but you kind of get one shot at this, <laughs> I just wanted it to be right, 
and I, I wanted to make it as right as I could. And, and uh, I mean, I, I, it was it was hard because uh, um, because I didn't really take him serious. And then when it happened, and when he died, and all of a sudden there were the ashes. It became very crucial that I try to do something as well as I can. And and. Uh, because I cared about him so much, and and, uh, and it, you know, so yeah, there was a there was a, I, it, there was it took me a long time to kind of figure out exactly kind of what I wanted to do, and uh, and to do something that I thought maybe he might like too, you know, so well, yeah, I mean, even if he did like it, he wouldn't admit it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to wrap it up, Hector. Is that maybe one more question? Sally. <laughs> Human ashes are not like ashes in a fireplace. Yeah. So did you have to work with those ashes before you could put them in? No, I didn't do anything. To, okay. I just threw I, I knew if, if I threw the whole thing into the vat that, and they all went into... Uh, the mo, it would just cluster, and it would you couldn't tell what it was. So there's about maybe a you know a quarter of the ashes are in the outside of the bird, and then the rest are on the inside. So, but I didn't do anything to. It was strange having him sitting on my you know <laughs> shelf for for a year. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I did speak to him quite often. <laughs> the boots? Yeah, I had the Randall knife, and, and uh, that, that's another thing that was on the altar that Travis brought. And, uh, and that, was a, that was a shock, too, because... I, uh, you know, they they left the boots and left the Randall knife, and, and I actually sent it. Uh, well, Travis, his son, uh, died shortly after that. Uh, had a heart attack and died, and, and uh, uh, so I sent the, the Randall knife to Dylan, his uh, son, Travis's son, guy's grandson, and uh, who has it now. And then I, ended, I also sent the boots. I had the boots for a while and sent those to Dylan as well. So. Um. Right. Well, everybody, thank you for being here. Terry Allen. <laughs>